Yeah, can you can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, good. And you can see my slides. Okay, perfect. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, great. So I am really honored to be a part of Teen Science Cafe this evening. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about what humans and stream invertebrates have in common. And um, before I get going on that, uh, let me see if I can, there we go. Before I get going on that, there we go. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so a little bit about my education. Um, it might sound cliche, but um, I have always wanted to be a biologist. And I can't remember a time when I didn't want to be a biologist. And so when I was an undergraduate, I took a lot of you know, biology classes. And one thing that I ended up doing was working in a genetics lab. And I, uh, I wanted to do research. And so, um, but I also had other loves besides genetics. Like I, I knew that I, I loved ecology. Um, this was back in the uh, maybe bad old days and uh, conservation biology was just coming into um, sort of a new um, era. And so I was really interested in conservation biology and I wanted to combine genetics and conservation biology. And one sort of obvious um, way to do that was to think about questions, research questions associated with population genetics. Um, and population genetics is, uh, let's see if I can get a, oh, here it is. Yeah, population genetics is a branch of biology that focuses on like the genetic composition of populations and then how that, um, how that genetic composition changes with respect to natural selection and inbreeding and even random factors. And so, uh, so I was interested in that and uh, I was also interested in cute organisms. And so I um, picked what I think is maybe the cutest organism, which is that little um, white-footed deer mouse. I don't know if you can see that right here. It's got these really big ears and these really big eyes and it was super cute. Um, but it's also a little bit hard to work on mammals. And so when I went to graduate school, uh, I realized that the question is more important maybe than the organism. Um, and so I picked another pretty cute organism, the Eastern mosquito fish right here, not nearly as cute as a, um, a white-footed deer mouse though. And then, um, when I uh, did postgraduate work, I um, went to the Everglades and you can see a picture of the Everglades right here. And my organism got even less cute. This is a grass shrimp. Um, but I studied how the landscape, the, um, the landscape of the Everglades affected the movement and the distribution of these populations of grass shrimp. And another project that I did in my postgraduate work was even on a less cute organism. This is a freshwater mussel called the Pleurobema. And in that work, I looked at um, conservation, genetics, and the relationship of different species to each other, because these are highly, a lot of these are highly endangered animals. So that's a little bit about uh, my education and a little bit about my career. Um, sometimes you get a job because it's your dream job, right? And um, sometimes you get a job because of an opportunity that arises. So I found myself in New Orleans with my family and um, I got a position at the University of New Orleans to teach biology. And it was there that um, I taught a lot of general biology. I also taught some ecology classes and I had known before, I'd already, I taught here and there before that position, and I knew I liked teaching, but it was at the University of New Orleans that I realized how much I love teaching, and I love teaching undergraduates, and so that was a great opportunity that just happened to arise. It wasn't what I considered to be my dream job at the time, but it turned into a dream job, um, and then um, and then my family, after Hurricane Katrina, moved to the Southern Appalachian Mountains, and I got a position at Western Carolina University. And at WCU, 
um, I was offered the position to teach anatomy and physiology. And I hadn't really taught human anatomy and physiology before, except as a graduate student um, in some of the labs. And so I was a little bit apprehensive, but it turned out that I love uh, human anatomy and physiology. And so I'm so happy that I have this job. Um, so, you know, you make, I think a lot of opportunities arise and if you take them, um, you don't know where they can lead you. And then sometimes you make opportunities. And one opportunity that I've made uh, sort of along the way in the last 10 years or so is um, something that I call the Cullowee Valley Creek Club. And this is a grant funded program that we have at a local school, local elementary school called Cullowee Valley School. And it meets after school. Um, we meet like there are maybe 15 or so uh, students that meet, fourth and fifth graders that meet, and we study the creek. And that's where my love of stream invertebrates comes in. And so you can see a picture here of um, the kids from this fall. So today, I'm going to combine um, some of those interests of mine, the interest in human anatomy and physiology, and my interest in stream invertebrates, and spend a few minutes telling you what they have in common. Um, and so what do they have in common? Well, if you open any uh, textbook in biology, you see that one of the central tenets of biology is that form is closely linked with function. So form are, is thing, anything that has to do with the structure. So the structure, the shape, the size, the color, of an organism or an organ or even a tissue or a cell. Um, sometimes if we think about human anatomy and physiology, that's the anatomy part of it. Function is what something does or what it's used for. And when we think about form and function in biology, they're tightly linked, typically. Typically they're tightly linked. And that's one of those um, maybe central tenets of biology. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about adaptations this evening, and um, adaptations are heritable behaviors, so it means that they're inherited, um, and their behaviors or um, some sort of morphological characteristic or some sort of physiological trait that increases the fitness of an organism to its habitat. So it increases the ability of the organism to survive and reproduce in that particular habitat. Um, I'll talk, I have a few examples from humans that I'll share with you tonight, and then I have a few examples with stream invertebrates. And then after I go through those examples, um, we'll do a little activity together. All right, so one example um, from humans, from human biology, is um, the form and function of a tissue called dense regular connective tissue. And this picture right here, I don't I hope you can see my laser. Can you see the laser right? Oh, like thumbs up. Okay, good. Okay, so here's the laser pointer right here. This is dense regular connective tissue, and we'll break that um, down a little bit. Connective tissues are tissues that um, they do a lot of things. They have a lot of functions, but one function they have is connect body parts. Okay, so this is dense, and it's um, if you look at it, it's really pink, and um, it's got these fibers these collagen fibers that are sort of parallel to each other. I, hopefully you can see that right here. Okay. Collagen is the um, one of the most common proteins in the human body. And collagen is a really like tough and sort of resistant to stress protein. Okay. And I just want you to compare this tissue right here for just a moment to this tissue right here. This is dense irregular connective tissue. Okay. And you can see it's densely packed with collagen fibers, these pink fibers. But those collagen fibers and dense irregular connective tissue run in every which direction. So this is a type of tissue, the dense irregular connective tissue. Um, it's a tissue that is important when uh, when it has to be pulled in all sorts of different directions. Dense regular connective tissue 
um, really gives the tissue strength in one direction because of the parallel uh, structure of those collagen fibers. Okay, so where do we see this and why is that important? Okay, so the parallel dense fibers, that's the form, the anatomy of it. And one place that we find dense regular connective tissue are in, um, is in ligaments and in tendons. Ligaments are structures that connect bone to bone, and tendons are structures that connect bone to muscle. So if you look at this picture right here, um, this is a diagram of your knee. And if you're when you're looking at this picture, you can see the front of the knee. So you can feel your own knee. You can feel your, um, your knee bone, your patella, right? And that's right here in this picture. Um, if you uh, feel the bone just below that in your shin, that's your tibia. Um, the bone in your upper like thigh is the femur. And we can see in this picture some of the muscles of the thigh. So these are your quadriceps muscles. And you may have heard of that. Other things that you can see in this picture, you can see the anterior cruciate ligament right here. So this is a structure that connects bone to bone. And this anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, is connecting the tibia right here to the femur in the upper leg. Um, you can also see other uh, ligaments. Here's another ligament. This is on the inside of the knee, and you can you can't really feel this, but you can imagine where it is if you feel the inside of your leg, um, the inside of your knee. So this ligament runs from the inside of the femur right here to the inside of the tibia. And then if you feel the outside of your knee, you can feel the collateral, um, the lateral collateral ligament right here. So this is the medial collateral ligament. This is the lateral collateral ligament. So these we can see these three ligaments, the MCL, the LCL, and the ACL, and they connect bone to bone. Now, if you think about what your knee does, right, um, your knee uh, has to uh, like hold the rest of your body up, right, from everything from your knee on up, it holds your body up. And your knee doesn't have a lot of wiggle room from side to side, does it? So this ACL, if we focus on this, the anterior cruciate ligament, its job, its function is to hold your knee and uh, to protect it uh, from sort of a, from twists and turns, from rotation. Um, so it really functions in um, holding your knee together in sort of this back to front uh, uh, way. If that does that make sense? Um, so. If you think about these fibers, right, they're parallel to each other, and these fibers are found in this ACL, and the ACL is um, holding your knee um, sort of a tight or in position from the back to the front. Now, you've probably heard of people that tear the ACL, and when that happens, it's because there's some sort of rotational uh, uh, rotation to the knee, and there's often a blow. And when that happens, those fibers um, kind of get torn in ways because they are they provide strength in one direction, but they don't provide strength in multiple directions. Okay. So this is a great example, I think, of form and function, how form and function are tightly linked. Another example, uh, form and function in humans, we're going to talk a little bit about bony landmarks. So this picture shows you the hip bone right here. And in green, you see a bony landmark. And bony landmarks are, um, are places where the bone is often thickened um, or elevated and rough. And you can see this sort of elevated, thickened area right here. This is on the ischium of the hip bone. And this is called the ischial tuberosity. And so this is a thickened, roughened surface on your hip bone. That's its form or its anatomy. And then you think, well, what is it used for? It is the site of muscle attachments. So this is the back of your leg, and these are your hamstring muscles. You can feel them in your own back of your leg. 
And these hamstring muscles are attached to the ischial tuberosity. And um, that attachment has to be, um, it has to prevent uh, stress. It ha or it has to withhold, be, uh, it has to uh, be able to withstand stress, right? Um, it has to be able to withstand a lot of pulling of the muscles. And so that's why we see this thickened elevated area right here. So form and function are tightly linked. Another example, and this is an example from uh, maybe my, my favorite uh, organ system in the human body, the urinary system. So what you're looking at right here is a cross section of the kidney. And we're gonna take this little bit of the kidney right here and we're gonna zoom it in. So we're zooming in right here. And we see that this area has these um, yellow, they're, they're, in this figure, they're yellow structures. These are the tubule systems, okay. the tubule system. And then this part in red, this is the circulatory system. So blood comes into this area and this area is a tuft of capillaries. We're gonna call this the glomerulus. Okay. And then filtered blood goes out. So one of the main functions of your kidneys is to filter blood. What's being filtered out? Well, a lot of water, a lot of salts, um, pharmaceutical drugs, toxins, these are all being filtered out of your blood and they are filtered out of your blood here at the glomerulus. So if you look at a kidney, any one kidney, there may be one, 1 1.2 million glomeruli or something like that. So you have a lot of glomeruli in your kidney. So this is the form, the anatomy. Okay. And this is another picture. Here we've taken a microscope slide and we've just blown it up. So you can see the glomerulus here this tuft of capillaries right here. So here's one, here's another one, here's another one. Um, this is another diagram of the glomerulus. You can see where the blood is entering the glomerulus here. Here's that tuft of capillaries, and then blood leaves the glomerulus. So the kidney glomeruli function in the filtration of your blood. And your body's going to reabsorb a lot of that stuff, a lot of the glucose and water and some of the salts, but the rest is going to be excreted as urine. So how does that work? So if we kind of drill in and we look at the glomerulus, here we have those um, capillaries, that tuft of capillaries right here. And one thing that it's kind of hard to see in this picture, um, but the capillaries are really leaky. So the capillary walls have um, pores between the cells and those pores allow a lot of the water and salts and even glucose to be filtered out of the blood. We also see that these capillaries in the glomerulus are covered with cells that make slits between them. And these slits are called filtration slits. So the water, um, so the blood is under high pressure, goes into the glomerulus, it moves into the glomerulus, and then that pressure um, causes the blood to be filtered, a lot of the um, water and salts and things like that to be filtered out of the blood. And then that filtrate is captured in this tubule system that you see right here, okay? Um, so how much filtrate? Right, so in 24 hours, your glomeruli filter approximately uh, 180 or so liters of filtrate. Um, that's about 50 gallons. And if you're trying to imagine what 50 gallons looks like, it's about 514 cans of soda. So that's filtrate or pre-urine. And if you think about, maybe you're thinking right now about how much urine you produce and it, you're realizing it's not 50 gallons of urine, that would be absurd. So what happens to it? Well, about 99% of the water gets reabsorbed. So on average in a 24 hour period, you're producing about one to two liters of urine and that's about five and a half, five 
5.5 cans of soda per day. So it's a lot less than 50 gallons. Um, so there's form, the anatomy of the glomerulus, and then the function to filter the blood. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about form and function and stream invertebrates. And when you think about stream invertebrates, um, a lot of what you collect in the stream, and maybe you've done this. In fact, I think that the last Teen Science Cafe that you had maybe talked about um, using macroinvertebrates as indicators of water quality in streams. Um, so what you were looking at when, uh, when you were in that um, presentation are the larval forms, probably the larval forms of flying insects. So here's an example. We're all familiar, I think, with the dragonfly. Um, dragonflies are terrestrial, they fly, and uh, the adult is the, the terrestrial form. The adults mate, the female oviposits eggs, uh, usually in water or damp area, and then those eggs develop into a larva. And this is what the larva you know, might look like of a dragonfly. And so the dragonfly larvae are aquatic. And this is true for a lot of stream invertebrates. A lot of the adults are terrestrial. A lot of the larvae are uh, aquatic. And so what we're looking at are the aquatic forms. And uh, if you're an aquatic larva, you need a way to obtain oxygen. So a lot of stream invertebrates have gills to capture the oxygen from the water. Um, and so I'll just kind of show you a couple of examples of gills and different types of stream invertebrates. Here's the dragonfly larvae that we were just talking about. And you can't see the gills on this critter until you look inside. And you specifically have to look inside its rectal chamber, inside its butt. And um, this is a picture, a longitudinal dis uh, section of the inside of the rectal chamber. And you can see, I think, these sort of uh, frilly um, appendages, not appendages, but these like frilly structures. These are the gills inside the uh, rectal chamber. And then this picture right here is a cross section through the rectal chamber. And again, you can see those very um, sort of frilly gills. And the dragonfly is a little bit remarkable. The dragonfly larvae is remarkable in that it can pump water into its rectal chamber and then out of its rectal chamber. So it pumps the water in and out and in and out. And as it does so, it's moving the water across the gills and then the oxygen from the water is diffusing across the gills so that the organism can obtain the oxygen. So what that means is that these dragonfly larvae can live in water where there are relatively, um, where there's a relatively low level of oxygen because it actively pumps the water or draws the water over those gills. We can contrast that with the stonefly larva over here. This is a stonefly larvae and what larva and what you're looking at is the underside of the stonefly larva. And you see these gills, I like to say that they're in the armpits of the stoneflies. Um, you can see the gills underneath the little legs right here. They look like tuft of, tufts of cotton. So these are the gills and in this stonefly larva and in most stonefly larva, larvae, the gills are not very extensive. And the stonefly larvae don't have that pumping mechanism. So in order for water to move across the gills so that oxygen can be obtained, the water has to be moving. It ha the, the animal doesn't have a way to move the water. And so what that does is really limits the stonefly larvae to oxygen rich water. So when you're thinking about where you find stonefly larvae versus where you find dragonfly larvae, you typically find stonefly larvae in well oxygenated water where the water is flowing rapidly. And 
you can find dragonfly larvae there, but you're just as likely or even more likely to find dragonfly larvae where the water is calmer, a little bit stiller. Um, and that's because of the form, the anatomy of these gills, which really drives the function, which really drives where we find these critters, the habitats that they're adapted to. Another example from stream invertebrates. This is a red midge larvae. Midges are gnats or noceums, so um, you're probably familiar with them, especially in the summer. They often appear on hot, humid days. Um, and some of them have these really red larvae. And the question is, why are they red? So the red color is their form. And the function of the red color, the red color comes from a hemoglobin-like protein. And if we think about our own bodies and hemoglobin in our own bodies, we know that hemoglobin sort of gloms on to oxygen in our blood and it carries the oxygen so that oxygen can move like through our own, you know, through our circulatory system to the tissues where it's needed. Well, these red midges don't really have um, blood in the same sense that we do. They have um, a fluid called hemolymph, but they have these hemoglobin-like proteins that are sort of scattered throughout their body, which makes them that red color. And the hemoglobin-like proteins have the same exact function in these red midges that it does in our own bodies. The hemoglobin-like proteins glom onto the oxygen, and so it provides the tissues of this critter with oxygen. So what that means is that these critters can live in really uh, low oxygenated environments because uh, the oxygen can diffuse through the skin and then glom onto those hemoglobin-like proteins. So we have form and we have function, and then that um, gives us a sense of what kind of habitats we will find these critters in. Now, we can find them in highly oxygenated areas. We often do. But if we're sampling uh, areas that are poorly oxygenated, we will find these, but we will not find stonefly larvae. Okay. So I've told you, I've, I've given you a few examples of how um, form and function are related, uh, how they're strongly linked. And I don't want to leave you with the idea that they are always linked. Sometimes they are unrelated. Um, so let's take an, one a look at one example of this. So we'll go back to our own red blood cells. And in humans, red blood cells have this biconcave shape. And that means that the red blood cells are concave um, in two directions, right? You can see that right here. They almost look like a lifesaver or you know, some sort of candy that has a biconcave shape. And if you Google that question, you know, why are red blood cells um, biconcave in shape? One of the answers you'll probably see is that this shape maximizes the ratio of cell surface area to volume. And in biology, we're always interested in the vol and the ratio of cell surface area to volume because things happen on the surface of cells. In the case of red blood cells in humans, the oxygen diffuses across the cell surface. So if there's a lot of cell surface, it allows for really quick diffusion of oxygen. Seems like a great hypothesis, except when you look at what these cells are doing inside of a capillary, here's a capillary, with some red blood cells uh, stacked up into it, uh, you see that a lot of these cells get sort of squished up. They lose their that biconcave shape. Some of them are oval shaped. Some of them are even like more teardrop shaped. Okay. And the one place in our body where oxygen is unloaded is from the capillaries to the surrounding tissues. 
And it is in this place in the capillaries that we see that that biconcave shape is not maintained. So it's a great hypothesis, but we don't actually have a lot of evidence for it. Okay. So another hypothesis is that maybe that shape, that biconcave shape, minimizes the red blood cell spin and helps the cells to move through those vessels. But again, we see that that biconcave shape is not maintained in those capillaries. And so we're left with another hypothesis, and that is that maybe this shape is just the easiest shape for these cells to relax into. The uh, red blood cells in humans don't have a nucleus. Um, they've lost a lot of their endomembrane system. If you're familiar with the shape of cells and what's in a cell, um, and it might be that this is just a shape that is easy for the cell to relax into. So maybe there's no uh, link between the function and the form in red blood cells. Or maybe there is, and we just haven't found it yet. That's another hypothesis. Um, all right, so I am uh, running out of time, but I wanted to remind you that one of the central concepts in biology is that form and function are strongly linked. It's not always the case but it's often the case. And it is one of those central tenets in biology. And remember that form describes the shape and the size and the structure of the organism. Function describes or um, it describes like what that function does or what it's used for. And form and function can adapt an organism to a particular environment. So, with that, I'd uh, like to stop and um, introduce the activity to you. And I think there's time at the end for questions. Um, I'm also happy to take questions now. Okay, okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the activity. Is that a reasonable way to go? Okay, good. All right, so, um, so, Around the room, I think you have maybe boards or you have um, you have some sort of paper that describes four different habitats in a creek. And these are habitats that um, I routinely sample with my fourth and my fifth graders. So one habitat is a riffle habitat. These are areas where there are a lot of um, like rocks in the creek and the water is moving like pretty swiftly over the rocks. And I should tell you right now that um, the Southern Appalachians is a wonderful place for streams because uh, we have relatively clean streams. We're able to get out in the streams and it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so these riffles are areas where the water's moving really fast. Sometimes my kids call them ripples and it, that's not correct, but it would remind you of ripples, right? So the water is moving and there are like little waves um, and this is an area that is uh, typically highly oxygenated. The water is typically relatively cold. Um, so there's a lot of diffused oxygen in the water in these areas. Another area where we often collect uh, macroinvertebrates is on the stream bank. And stream banks can be really variable. They can um, be areas where the water is relatively still. Um, they can be areas where there's a lot of sediment in the water, particularly if there's a lot of erosion. Um, and sediment can clog the gills of a lot of these critters. Um, another area that we sample are um, pools. Pools are still areas in the stream. Um, they're often deeper. Often there are fish in the pools. A lot of uh, if people fish for trout, they often fish for trout um in the pools or near the pools and then a fourth habitat um, is something that we call leaf packs and leaf packs are particularly important in the fall this is um they they form when leaves fall into the creek and then uh, the leaves sort of get smashed together forming like a leaf sandwich almost and in those leaf packs we tend to find critters that use the leaves for food 
So we have these four different types of habitat, and I think they're around the room. And your job for the activity is to find macroinvertebrates. So here's an example of a macroinvertebrate you might find. I don't, can you see? Oh, maybe there you go. Okay. And so this is called a three tailed flattened scraper mayfly. Um, if you look on the back of it, it has its name and it has a little bit about what it is. So it's a mayfly. And if you look at the legs, this one has really strong legs for clinging to rocks and debris. It eats decaying plants and detritus. And so your job is to think about what type of those four habitats might you find this critter in. And it can be found in more than one habitat. Um, so there are a lot of correct answers with this, a lot of correct matches. There are some incorrect matches too. Um, and we'll talk about those. So uh, I don't know, do you need to know anything else about the activity right now? Are you ready to get going on it? Sure, I'll do that. There you go.
Okay. Okay, yeah, so um, maybe we can go through a little bit like habitat by habitat. So uh, I told you a little bit about the leaf packs and leaf packs are like those leaf sandwiches and they are a super important um, type, you know, food source, especially in the fall when all of the leaves are falling into the stream and then getting packed together. So. Uh, when you thought about what organisms went into the leaf packs, what were some of the ones that you put in there? I think that's So I don't know, um, did you put, so one, one is, I don't, did you put this guy in there? This is the giant shredder. Is that one that you have in there? So these are, um, these are maybe some of our favorite macroinvertebrates because um, they, their name, right? They're giant. They're sometimes they're like, you know, they're an inch or inch and a half or so in size. So they're really big, typically. And they're shredders. And what a shredder does is it shreds up those leaves and it eats the de it eats the leaves and it eats decaying um, like leaf matter or decaying debris that's on the leaf. So this is one that we will find this guy. This is a, a stonefly, but we'll find stone we'll find him in riffles. But um we find them most often in leaf packs because of the food that it requires. So did you put that in there? Okay. Another one that maybe you put in there, um, these are these little guys, this is called a fragile detritivore. So this is another stonefly and these are small. 
I'll tell you that um, my fourth and fifth graders don't really like to uh, pick through the leaf matter to get these because they're so small. They really like big things. Um, but these fragile detritivores, um, a lot of them are shredders, and so they live in the leaf packs. We can find them other places, but they're really common in the leaf packs. And then I think somebody, I'm trying to find my water. Oh, here's another something that lives there. Um, this, did you put this guy in there? This, this is called a stick bait caddis fly. You have, yeah. Did, yes. Did, oh, go, you go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I love that. In fact, these are so well camouflaged that often um, we miss them. Uh, we just think that, you know, it's a little, it's like leaves or sticks sort of stuck together. And um, it's not until you pick it up and you like look at it carefully that we realize there's a critter inside that. Yeah, that's a perfect. Um, another one that maybe you put in there, I'm trying to find mine. Uh, did anybody have a water worm? It looks like this. Yeah, did you put that into the leaf pack? Good. Yes, yep, that's exactly right. So they love, they eat a decaying vegetation and leaf debris. And this is another one that um, the kids that are involved in Creek Club love to find because they're often huge. Again, like one or two inches and it's hard to see on this picture, but um, they're almost clear. So you can see the digestive system inside, which is kind of cool. So those are some of the most common things that we find in leaf packs. Um, if we move on to riffles, uh, what did you put in a riffle? Yes, yes, yep. Common net spinning caddis flies are um, really common there. And before we go on, I should tell you that the names that we are using are names that um, that a group out of Asheville uses. Um, uh, it's the stream monitoring information uh, system. And so we use the same ones, but these are obviously not scientific names. And they're not even uh, common names that other people would recognize. So we use it because they're easy for, uh, you know, little kids to remember. So yeah, the common net spinning caddis fly is definitely one you would find there. What else would you find in a riffle? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Fingernet caddis flies, you'd find there as well because they make these little tiny nets in the in the water, um, almost microscopic. And those nets capture any of like the debris that might be uh, moving with the current. Good, good. Um, what about pools? What did you put in pools? Uh, 
Okay, good. Yep. You'd find dragonfly larvae in pools. Um, depending on the depth of the pool, a lot of dragonfly larvae like uh, like shallower areas, but you can find them there. Um, I don't know. We don't. Go ahead. Yep. Good. Yes, that's actually, that's, that's correct. Yeah. So red midges um, are often found in pools. Um, a lot of them are found sort of uh, buried in the sediments where they make like little hidey holes out of the sediment and they tend, yeah, and, and perfect, right? They can live in those lower um, oxygen, oxygenated areas. Anything else in your pool? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Aquatic worms. Um, exactly. And then the other thing that you might find in a pool are um, some of those coiled snails. I don't know if you had any of those. Um, so pools are often hard to sample because they're deep. And, um, you know, sometimes we, I, I don't know, I don't, the the worms and things like that are maybe uh, you know, people don't like those as much, I guess. Um, so, but yeah, those are the things that we would commonly find in the pools. What about the stream banks? Those are the most variable habitats, I think, that we have. So what might you find there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, caddisflies. The, this is the fingernet caddisfly. You would find that there, potentially. I don't know if you had that one or um, the striped net spinning caddisfly. Did you have that one? That one, good. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Those, um, the, the two-tailed and the three-tailed mayflies are, um, are ones that you would find in pools. You would also, they are pretty, uh, they, they are found in a lot of these habitats. They're pretty common. And so, but you're absolutely correct for those reasons. Good. Good. Um, so I think we're almost out of time. It's it's 7.01 right now. What questions do you have? Oh, so yeah, so that's a really good question. So dragonfly larvae can be big. They can be maybe three quarters of an inch or so, but they can be really small too, right? So they are, so like every, like all of these um, insects, they go through different, um, they metamorphose. So they start out as an egg and then they get larger and larger and larger. So sometimes they're really small, right? When they're like, when they've just hatched out of the egg and we can't, probably we don't see those. And it's not until they're bigger that we see them, but they can get quite large um, in three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch. So they can be big. It's a good question. Okay, I think, so I, I'm, I couldn't hear some of your question, but I think you were asking about the evolution of the hemoglobin-like protein 
in the red midges. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So I don't actually know the answer to that question. That's an that's an awesome question, <laughs> and um, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to look at <laughs> look look for the answer. Actually, um, I don't I don't know the answer to it. And when you when you research that, sometimes you see that um, that people just call it hemoglobin, and um, I'm not, I don't think it's exactly like our hemoglobin. So I think it's a little bit different, but I don't know. Um, I don't know the relationship to our hemoglobin. I can, I can, I'll try to find out and I can email Lynn and then she can let you know Will that work. Okay, so I, th I again, I th you kind of faded in and out, but I think you were asking what kind of data we collect. Is that right? Okay, um, yeah. So it is variable because they're little, but we really do try to follow the scientific method. So we really try to spend um, a lot of time. Like these are the kids that participate will participate all year long generally, and we start out the way any scientist would start out, you know, what what are the questions that we have, right? And then from those questions, we develop hypotheses, and then we collect the data to, um, you know, either support or refute those hypotheses. And then an important part of the scientific method is um, analyzing your data and presenting your data. They always present to their parents. Um, so this semester they've been collecting data um, regarding what what they would find like what critters they would find in what organ uh, in what habitats um, and this is something that we've done in the past in little in different ways like in the past we've made um, artificial leaf packs in the fall so you take a bunch of leaves and you put them in like a like a plastic mesh bag almost and you can make big leaf packs and you can make small leaf packs and uh, you can open up the leaf packs after two weeks or after four weeks and you can see um, what type of critters colonize those leaf packs and how many they are and how the communities change. Um, so that's one of our favorite things that we like to do in the fall. And then we've collected these data from year to year. So we have an idea of how that changes from year to year. Now, that being said, um, sometimes 10 and 11 year olds get really tired of sorting through leaf packs pretty fast. And so, um, you know, they'll, they're good for about 15 or 20 minutes and then they stop. And um, sometimes you can bribe them with gummies or something like that, but often they're done. So it just depends, right? Um, so uh, I have, I shared a website with Lynn um, and it's sort of a half-baked website about our Creek program, but um, it has some of our data that we've collected on it. Oh, okay. Ooh, that is such a good question. Um, they don't have eyes. They have uh, like little hairs on their body that they use as sensory organs. So they can definitely um, sense their environment, but they don't have eyes. I don't know. I doubt that they can hear, but they can probably feel vibrations. They can certainly feel um, like, you know, sediment and things like that. Okay, I did. Um, I didn't catch that at all. I'm sorry. Oh, that's such a good question. So the interaction of the different invertebrates, I love it. Okay, well, um, so you, as you can imagine, um, some of them are predators and they'll eat each other. In fact, if you collect, um, you know, if you collect a predator and you put it in with something. It might eat it. Uh, 
you know, that's one of the things that happens a lot. Um, sometimes they don't interact at all, or there are sort of loose interactions. Sometimes they compete for food resources. So they're competitors. If the food resource is limited, um, if we think about how they interact with things other than invertebrates in the stream, um, a lot of fish will eat uh, macro invertebrates. Um, so they interact in that way. Uh, so competition, predation, those are maybe some of the bigger ways that they interact with each other. It's a good question. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question. So the the water penny is the larva of a beetle, and it does have legs. Um, and if you looked at the under, I don't think I have a picture of the underside of it, but if you looked at the underside of it, you would see its legs. But they can sort of crawl. They they um they're they're you know they're stuck to uh, rocks. They they kind of get fastened to rocks, but they definitely also crawl. And if you take it off the rock, if you scrape it off the rock, you can see it maybe, um, we put them in dish pans to look at them and they'll crawl across the bottom of the dish pan. So they definitely have a way, they have ways to move. It's a great question. Thank you so much for having me.